Tá wow, tan se. Miu kik se tao. Good morning. Hello. Welcome. It's a beautiful morning, I said in my language, the Cree language. My name is Betty. Most people call me Miss Betty. Uh, I use the word elder, but in my language, I say keteya. I'm taking back that culture and that language piece. So I'm going back to honoring my language and the culture with it in the language. So that's who I am. I'm a mother, grandmother, and a great grandmother. I live here in Treaty 6 Territory, Edmonton. I didn't grow up here. I didn't, I, but I've been here for 50 years or so. And I come from a community northeast of La Flabish. Uh, my mother was from the Beaver Lake First Nations. And um, we grew up uh, just, I can't even give you a name, but a little community called Imperial Mills, only because there was a little uh, uh, sawmill there. It was, uh, that's where my father got a job and that's where we lived. And uh, there wasn't even a road into that place. You could only get there by a railroad train, which ran once a week. So my background, like I say, I speak my language fluently. Uh, first language is Cree um, and English is my second language. So there's times that I struggle sometimes in just saying uh, some English words because I've made it my journey since I was 38 years old. Uh, you know, I had the language. It was not nice or wasn't welcome for us to speak our language. So we were always told, you know, um, because of trauma, etc. how we were told that our languages would never get us anywhere as indigenous people. I mean, that we were even to try to sound like you had an accent was uh, how we were taught even to pronounce the English words without that Cree accent. So when I think about those things today, I love it. I just think those people, However that happened in my young life, I will never allow them to rule me today. I won't give them the power because I am a Cree woman, I speak my language, and I'm so happy to, to meet you all today. And I look forward to spending a little bit of time with you. And, and yeah, thank you. Iksimaka, my hi. Healing involves patience and time. How did you overcome the legacy of residential schools? Well, my dear, it's been a long journey. It's been a long journey that I had to uh, work so hard when I realized at 38 years old <clears throat> is when I started to heal. All those years I held it, whatever it was in me, I held it and I couldn't share it with anybody. I didn't feel safe. I didn't, I couldn't share it with anybody. Nobody did that. We pretended like everything was good. Everything was great. We didn't have nothing that was further suffering from. So it was very, um, it made me sick. It made me sick. I didn't realize by hanging on to all of that trauma, the pain, everything was making me sick inside, making me very sick. Even as a mother, as a mother, I married when I was 19, had my children, even then lost so much of the parenting skills that were taken away because they were trying to make us into something we would never be and that's to make us non-indigenous and be colonized for the rest of our life so we could be functioning uh, people but in saying that my healing was not easy 
I was so fortunate, and like you are today, I, when I started the journey, it was one of the most difficult things I had to do. And the one thing I was very fortunate to have was elders. I call them Peteya. They were my elders. They were people that, when I, when I, sorry, I should say, when I was 38, I'd already be living in here for probably um, over 10 years. And being alone and not be able to speak your language. And I got to know when my kids started going to a high, uh, to a school here in Edmonton called the Ben Cathode School. That was an, it still is an indigenous school. So that's where I started to meet other indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, uh, not so much Inuit yet, but that's how I got to be, um, to under, I mean, that's how I got to meet people of my own kind that went through the same thing, elders who took me under their wing and actually over spending about a year or two with them, and not every day, but as much as I could because I was still a parent, but they put me out on a, on a, on a fast to have a look at myself and to let go of all that pain and that trauma I went through. And that was the most difficult thing I ever did in my life, but also one of the best things I ever did because I opened up inside. I opened up everything. I looked at everything that happened to me, always blaming myself, carrying the pain, always, always, I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. And an adult to say that at 38 years old, for me, it was really sad. And when I started to say, turn that around and say, I am good enough. I am smart enough. Our culture, my language is beautiful. I don't know how I kept my language, but our languages as Indigenous people and probably other nations of people are embedded in our spirit. Our spirit lives right here where we feel that heartbeat. That's where our spirit lives. So that's where everything is embedded. Even we go through the worst times in residential school, beaten and you name it. Sometimes they couldn't sever that spirit. They couldn't because they couldn't, unless they killed us, right? And they did many times. But when the elders took me, they heard what, I, what happened and how I came to be who I was. And they showed me the way, the way of our people. They took me and showed me what true love is, how to love myself again, because I thought I loved my children just because it was all surface stuff. I couldn't really hug them and love them because I didn't know what that meant. At 90 years old, I took care of my grandma after I was married and she lived till 90. On her last breath in the hospital, she knew when she was gonna go, because four days prior, she said to me, my girl, I'm gonna go now. I said, where are you going? You know, no, you can't go, I'm coming with you. I'll take you. And she said, where I'm going, you can't come with me. And I guess that meant she was gonna pass on to the, the next level of life. So I stayed with her, all my family. And then that last day when she was here, it was the only time I ever, ever heard from my family, my siblings, anybody. It was from my grandma that said three words, I love you. But in Cree, it's kisagitin. Kisagitin means much more in Cree than it does in English to say, I love you. So when you grow up with that, 
you go up to those things that were said to you that were ingrained in your brain that's that's the hardest thing to overcome and sometimes some people cannot overcome those things because they were so severely damaged and it's a lot of work and what i come to know today is i am one of the fortunate ones i'll never be fully healed i'll never be fully healthy i'll never be but today i make the best of every day that i get to live i share my story i want children like you and many others that i work with to know we have to as residential school survivors and i wasn't even in a uh, uh, one of those where they took you away the residential school was right in my community so i can't even imagine and but here's the thing i want to say and i want you to know that when pain is inflicted on us with hate by words is the harshest thing you can do to a child that's the most horrible thing you can do to a child if you slap a child they'll get over it but when you say those ugly words to them it's so embedded in our in our memory and in our heart our spirit doesn't take it but our heart does so my healing for me is a journey it's a journey like i'm 75 i'm going to be 76 and i i'm so proud to say that because i never thought i'd live to be i always thought 60 year old you know you know you'll be dead right and here i am at 75 going on 76 and i'm so honored because there's so much more to learn there's so much more to do and those years that were taken from me i've taken them back and i will continue to do so for my children today yet my grandchildren my great grandchildren my chapons i treasure them and i and i've adopted many children because i've never had a childhood a normal childhood i guess or to have teenage years and that's another story but that's who i am a little bit about who i am and how i continue every day to uh, recognize something that comes up from my past i recognize it and i know how to to help myself because the elders that helped me have passed on to the next level of life that's including my grandma my father my mother and those elders that adopted me uh simaga and hi what is a memory you have about your time at the residential school when you don't know you under you don't understand a language just remember i only spoke fluent cree till i was 6 years old i was taken to the school and they open the door and it's a big old door remember this is years ago this is probably in 1950 maybe 53 that's a long time ago so when they open the doors and it was be i don't know if you've seen a barn door have you seen a barn door with a big lock like this you could like made out of wood you could close it well when my mom had to take me because if they didn't take me to school there was my they could go to jail they would all the children would be taken away and they had um police people with guns forcing parents to take their children and our parents stood back helplessly some of them that had to go further than where i did it wasn't to that extent but i remember my mom taking me 
And I couldn't figure out why. And she kept telling me in, in Cree, you know, you're going to have to go to school now. You got to go to school. And, and I didn't know what that meant. But um, she said, just go there and I'll come back and get you. So I, when I, when she opened the door and I seen that, just like a one room shack, I, I like, I don't know. But I can't even remember describe, but what I remember the most when my mom had to leave and I had to go with this man there and I'm standing there, I don't know what to do. And then he comes along and puts that latch on the door. It's like a big, that's it. I mean, this is a gentle one of my memories I'm telling you. I don't wanna tell you other horrific images, stories that I witnessed, I can't, and I can't do that right now. But that's the one I want to tell you when you are so helpless and you lock that door from the inside and you couldn't reach it because I'm, you know, six years old, I'm not very tall, but it was a high one. Yeah. And not knowing, not knowing, not knowing what to do, where to go. And you look at the other children from our community and they're looking like that youth. Like you're, so, we're all so scared, just terrified. So that's one of the memories. Why are some memories hard to share or speak out loud? Hmm. Well, you just heard me say something and I didn't want to share it, but a little bit about watching and being terrified that knowing something bad was going to happen in the school like this let's say this is a school i'm sitting in the front here this is my desk but in the back here would be a, like a little closet and they they had a, a black cloth like like almost like a shower curtain, but you block that off. They were supposed to keep supplies and whatnot in that room. But one of the things that's so horrifying that I had to overcome was this guy would take a couple of little girls and bring them behind that curtain and they would close the curtain and you could hear whimpering. That today still breaks my heart. That's all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What happens when you share a difficult story with students such as us? I want to share the story, not so much the, the difficult stories, but you are at a age where you can understand and you'll go forward in this life and you're gonna know the truth. Because how can we have truth? I mean, reconciliation without truth. We cannot have reconciliation without me telling you this truth and many others who have come to tell you truth. What happens is when I share these difficult stories with you and I talked about the truth and you are being a witness to that story I'm telling you and you should always take that with you when you're learning about the history, the genocide of Canada, Canada's indigenous people. First Peoples of Canada, you will take those stories. You will take that learning. You're going to educate yourself and you're going to be an advocate. You're going to be uh, an ally. You're going to do everything you can to get those stories out, just like the stories of the Holocaust, stories of many um, other nations that we learned about in, I don't remember learning anything, but 
people have told me they learned about the Holocaust and other people's um, trauma, tragedy, uh, genocide, you name it. So that's what I hope that you would take from what I am sharing you with today, sharing with you today. So why do you think that in Indigenous cultures and traditions, stories carry the power to heal? Well, my dear, culture and traditional stories heal, they do. And I shared that earlier when I talked to you, told you about my elders and how they helped me heal and how I got to be where I am today. That's the power of telling stories. That's the power of that truth yet to be told by many others, not just me. That for me is, you know, healing. Mm -hmm. As elders, you have resilience and strength that many others don't. Um, what are some thoughts that you can share to support others that are going through difficult times? You know, a sad part of it is the, the healing of adults. My parents, parents today, grandmothers, grandfathers, or elders, you name it, um, to have some kind of support, to have hope, and to always know, yes, those horrible, horrible things happen to us. But we cannot allow people from the grave to rule us today. Take a cry if you have to. Do whatever it is to scream if you have to. But never allow the people from those graves or those ones that are in jail or wherever they are to ever rule you today. To have that control over you. Never. And that. We need to help one another by sharing our stories. We need to, we need to be, um, we need to be really strong together to help those that need to find their way, to help those that we can't force anybody to heal. We can't. You can never do that. Don't think you could ever force anybody. Oh, just and there's this, there's this old thing I say. I've heard it so many times. Oh, I don't know why don't they don't just get over it. Can you tell me when people say that? Can you tell me how can I get over that curtain and that whimpering? How can I get over that when I knew behind that curtain what was happening? It's just a little example of uh, some of the things that um, you know, people have to look at when they're healing on that healing journey, and that I pray that they uh, they uh, find the strength. And I pray every day for people, you know, my sisters and my brothers, my relatives from all over. And we see so much. We see so much today. Sometimes. You know, they say, you know, people are homeless. They live in poverty. Why are they addicted? Why, 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 why? And uh, and you have children taken away from you. And there's that, that's what they call that inter intergenerational trauma. So how many generations are we still living that trauma? We don't know how to heal. So of course, alcohol or drugs kills the pain for a little while, but then we have to have more and more and more. Pretty soon we've lost everything. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not. I never say that. You know, everybody heals differently. Everybody heals differently. Everybody sees things differently. And that's what we have to remember.
Lastly, why is it important to share your experiences about residential schools? That's a good question. We need to continue talking about residential schools. If we don't, you will never find truth to have truth and reconciliation. You think about all those unmarked graves, and I'm sure as young people, you know, you heard and seen unmarked graves. It kind of seems like we're kind of falling away from that. It's almost like, oh yeah, it happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that's still there. It's so fresh. Residential schools are important because they bring out, it brings out the truth. Why indigenous people suffered so much in their own country, their own land that was taken away from them. I could never go to another country and take away a people's land and start teaching them my way. I could never go to, let's say Poland and say, okay, Polish people, my turn now. You're gonna to listen to what I have to say. This is how I want you to live. You do not speak your languages anymore. You don't practice your culture anymore. You're gonna do what I have to say. What I'm telling you, what you're gonna do. And I'm gonna give you, put you in these little square boxes, we're gonna call reservations, and that's where you're gonna live. And you're gonna follow what I have to say and where you can go, how far you can go. You come to me if you wanna go, you know, visit your relative a couple down, a couple uh, kilometers away. You have to come and see me first so I could give you a, a permission slip to go there. That was called the PASS system. Without residential school awareness, without res studying reg uh, residential school, I don't think as much we're talking about today, Orange Shirt Day, uh, you know, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, boys. I don't even know what the acronyms are anymore. But all those that are still happening today, how do we even become, you know, just by little what you guys are doing today, you beautiful students, you're listening to me. And, and I wouldn't tell you this without having lived it. And I say to the people, many, many thousands of residential school survivors, if I cut my hand, or can you cut your hand? We bleed the same, our pain is the same. We have to heal it, we have to stitch it up, we have to heal it. That's your pain and my pain are the same. Because along the line, I'm about the fifth generation from my family of residential school survivors. So, I'm, I'm really, uh, I've really had a good time this morning chatting with you and your questions are really good questions. But I need to remind you, sometimes uh, even our elders have a difficult time answering some of your questions, which is okay. But maybe now, maybe some are not ready right now. Even as I read them over and over again, I, oh yeah, I'm ready, I can do this. But when you actually say, and then you think, uh oh, you know, uh oh. But you know what, I'm okay now. I'm okay because I need to just share that with you. Thank you very much. Like, yeah, we have learned a lot. And these kids, they need to know, they need to know the truth and how it is. <laughs> 